Okay, it's just after two o'clock, and um, I think we had a technical issue on my end where I somehow closed the webinar. Um, so I apologize. We'll give everybody a couple more minutes um, since they got removed from the webinar. I apologize. So again, we're going to wait a couple extra minutes because some people might not realize that they're not on the webinar anymore. Looks like people are still filtering in. All right, well, if there are anybody that jumps in late, again, that I apologize. Um, I clicked the wrong button and shut down the webinar, kicked everybody out. Just trying to keep you guys on your toes because um, that's, uh, that's what timing's all about, right? Um, staying on your toes. So, um, yeah, welcome. We're going to go through uh, race day virtual events. And um, I think some of you have already been dabbling with a lot of these features. Um, others are just looking to learn. Um, because there's so many different things we're going to talk about, we're not going to go um, into huge detail um, for any one thing. Um, so if you do want to pause and kind of take a deeper dive, um, please let me know. Um, and I will, uh, you just need to add in a question. Um, and I do have Matt Avery on um, with me so that, uh, and he can, he can help answer um, questions as they arise. <laughs> yes, Derek, it was a great webinar while it lasted. Um, the longest one you've ever been a part of. So that being said, we're going to get going. Um, so current situation, things haven't really changed that much um, over the past few weeks, um, except for the fact that some municipalities are beginning to open up slightly. Um, and with that, um, you know, timers are beginning to get more and more prepared for the changing industry. Um, a lot of you have also helped events go virtual. Um, and, and most of you are seeing that it is actually a viable um, strategy. So again, we're not gonna dive in too much into any one specific thing, but um, we will uh, point you towards places on the Run Sign Up site where you can learn more about it or towards uh, blogs or webinars that we've done previously. So um, right now, for those events that are uh, starting to come back, it's basically trying to figure out ways to offer a no-touch race experience or a very limited um, touch experience. Um, and a lot of races and a lot of municipalities are, are looking at a lot of these steps to, uh, or for guidance on how, how they're going to roll out these events. And it goes without saying, maybe you as a timer might not have as many um, safety features in place, but race for those of you that are race directors, um, there's there's a huge expectation for you to have safety measures and flexibility uh, for all of the different changes that that you're going to see. So the the goal overall is, and the goal is kind of shifting right now. Initially, the goal was completely to reduce cancellations and to keep runners coming. Now the goal is slightly shifting to uh, to engaging runners and bringing them in. A lot of events now, uh, they're either, some are still shifting over from, uh, some of your fall events might, or your, your summer events might be shifting over to like a virtual type of event. But otherwise, um, a lot of events that are coming out right now are actually new events that are setting expectations early for what, what's going to happen during the event itself. Um, and so 
as we always kind of point out, you do need to differentiate yourself from other virtual experiences. A lot of people are doing this by having different swag. Uh, some are offering creative scoring or challenge options. Um, so all of this is, is just a way to stand out. And um, that's all while the industry is still uh, financially constrained. So people are still looking to you as the timer to have a lot of these answers as you're the ones who uh, play with the technology more than just about anyone. So um, you essentially have an opportunity to lead the industry. So currently, and, and these are not equal, um, but currently there's, there's several different event options. One is traditional, and I know that 99.99% .99 of all of us want those races back now. Um, obviously, we still want to be safe, but that's what we want to do. We want to go throw mats, we want to go crunch numbers, and we want to see people you know, physically running across our finish line. Um, so traditional events are defined course routes. Um, they're typically com completed in one day. Obviously, some ultra events are a little bit longer. They're officially timed and scored, and there's full event support with a with a marked course. Um, a lot of events have kind of moved into this hybrid realm, um, and this hybrid realm is kind of how things are coming back, and that is uh, defo defined course routes, but there's more options. So this might be from expanded race dates and times. Um, so instead of having a gun that goes off and everyone starts, uh, an open start finish line, that's open for hours or even days. The course may or may not be marked, um, and they may or may not be official times um, as they might be using virtual results to to enter results. Um, in this hybrid um, option, like this hybrid section, you as a timer can still provide a lot of services, and um, and we'll kind of point those out and how to. Um, traditional, you know, we're not going to talk about too much just because most of you guys know exactly what you would do if you had a normal 5K tomorrow. It wouldn't be a big, a big jump. Um, so the hybrid's kind of where we start mixing in a lot of these new tools that run signups come out with. Um, and then the purely virtual slash race anywhere options, um, that is more of a complete, dis a complete distance from anywhere uh, or a cumulative achievement. That would be, um, I know many of you have probably heard about a lot of the, uh, the challenge events that have been going on. Um, so, and you're gonna offer virtual results and this could be, uh, or in almost every scenario, these are user submitted times. Uh, they're typical, you set the start and finish dates, not times. And, um, and there can be approvals in place. Most scenarios aren't, actually doing awards just because it's so hard to um, to confirm whether or not people are completing certain courses. So for challenge events, which is kind of new, um, I guess it's, it's new in the grand scheme of things, um, we have a way that athletes can enter in information. And again, we're not gonna dive in specifically on how to set all of this up. Um, there are, Run Sign Up's done a couple of, uh, at least one webinar and several blog posts on the setup of challenge events and so you can set up um goals for people as of i believe it was this morning um we now have a basic team function where you can do uh cumulative teams um or cumulative team scoring within the virtual results um and you can have um you can have progress percentages um they can put in comments and you can also do different activities. So all of this plays out, um, obviously for a, for a triathlon style event, you wouldn't have an overall pace, but there's paces per, um, per uh, different discipline. So some things to think about, actually some things to like really make sure you do if you're helping set up these events. And the reason why I'm talking about the setup briefly is because so many events don't know what to do. And so you pitching this idea of a challenge event to them is fantastic. You know, it's great. Except for if that's all you do, if all you do is say, hey, there's this thing called a challenge event, you should check it out. 
in my opinion, you're selling yourself short because if you play with it, you learn how to do it. Now you can tell that same group, hey, there's this thing called challenge event. I think this would be a really creative way since you can't hold your real event. I think this would be a really creative way for you to go. I'll help set it up and manage your data. And this gets your foot in the door to, you know, or keeps your foot in the door uh, to keep working with the event. So the reason why I have this little capture up here, it's at the very, very top of the, um, the enhanced virtual results settings. And that is no bibs, no results. So personally, I would suggest not sending out physical bibs. And we'll talk about the digital slash virtual bibs in a bit, but I would strongly advise you to set those up. And the reason being is because if you haven't gotten into uh, race fulfillment for any events, um, putting specific bibs in specific bags with the right t-shirt, with the right mailing label, there's a lot of variables going on there. And if you don't have to put that bib in there, it will make your life significantly easier. If instead you can send out the virtual bib or the digital bib, um, it's plug and play and the shipping process becomes significantly easier. If you're not sending out bibs, then it doesn't really matter. Um, so again, I would, I would suggest not setting up uh, or not sending out real bibs and then setting up automatic bib assignment during the registration. Um, and so once you do that, then you can turn on registration and you can set the bib numbers prior to the first message being distributed. So the messaging is, hey, it's race day, here's how you submit your results. And those are automated, uh, automated um, messages that you can set up through the virtual results platform. Um, and if you do set up those messages before bibs, it, complete, it, it can completely foul up your um, your result submissions. So please, please, please make sure that you do this appropriately. Um, also, there's a lot of times where uh, newer timers will reach out and say, hey, um, I'm, I'm trying to set all this stuff up. I, for some reason, people can't put in their, um, they can't submit their times, or I can't set race joy to work for this event, except for on the event date. And that's because two things. One, in the race wizard on step one, you have to have your event dates set to the entire time that the race is open for results. Secondarily, you have to have this result settings set for the same thing. And a lot of people will go in and just set a, you know, 523-2020 to 524-2020. And so, it's only going to accept result submissions in between those um, those times or those days and times. So just please make sure you're you're paying attention to that. So we show this a lot. We're going to go through a number of these steps, um, but this is our suite. Um, just a quick rundown of how you can use each one of these and how you can sell each one of these to your events. Registration is pretty easy. Um, you've used our registration before, it, or more than likely you've used it before. Um, and you can set up like streamlined registration, especially if um, you're doing a set race morning or day or 24 hours where you don't care as much about information, like all the data fields. You can, by time, set fast registration modes um, to decrease all the fields so that people aren't entering their phone number and they're not you know picking a t-shirt or anything like that because it's race day um you can also with registration a, a number of people have um well we're going to get into that in a second actually so we're going to go through registration bid management check-in um so for the registration side um obviously if they're registering online they're not touching any of your things um so keep registration online. And with that, um, a number of race production teams have 
um, have gotten smart and basically said um, that what, what we're going to do is we're going to set up a QR code and that QR code is going to point towards um, towards our registration page. And that way they don't have to have a kiosk out for people to register. Um, so just keep in mind that putting that computer out, you can, you can do whatever you'd like, but if you're gonna have a physical presence at a race, I would strongly advise um, having a touchless registration by, um, by creating a QR code. You can go to a um, you can Google QR code generators um, and you can point those at URLs and you can print that out and put it like on your, your check-in table. People can scan it with their phones and it will point them towards registration. They never have to touch any of your stuff. Um, so also keeping open, uh, keeping registration open for all of your expanded race dates. Um, obviously you want people, if you're, if you're allowing people to race a challenge and it's, you know, it's 30 days long, you want people to register at least 29 of those 30 days um, because you want that revenue generation or, or your event that you're supporting wants that revenue generation. Um, so, and then also with all of this, um, the whole point of the suite is that all of this data integrates completely with the rest of the suite. So for the bid management side, again, um, there are, I have, I personally have likely done about four or five different webinars on different ways to, to do bid management. Um, it's a super easy system to use. Uh, you can go in, create a test event if you need to and play around with it. Um, I would personally, I would suggest using the, um, the very first option underneath um, bid management. And so if you go into uh, your race day tools and under bibs, assign bibs and chips, all you're gonna do is you're gonna click on assign bib numbers at time of registration. And when you do, um, you'll be able to set your ranges of bibs that you wanna use. If you're using digital bibs, then you can pick whatever numbers you want to. Um, for a lot of events that are going um, in person, they're going to dynamic bib assignment. And so part of the reason is because it speeds up check-in and part of it is because the, um, the volunteer or staffer doesn't actually have to touch the bid. So that can be scanned from a foot away or so. It might have to be a little bit closer, but you could easily set up like a plexiglass situation where they, they push the bib against the plexiglass and you, you scan that through the, uh, the, the plexiglass. Um, just a reminder for those of you that haven't used our check-in app, um, it does work with uh, with the, the barcode scanners that are the trigger-based um, barcode scanners. However, if you're doing it off of people's phones or, or if you're trying to scan anything off of a phone or through a glass, that reflection is going to be problematic. So I always suggest using a, um, a camera-based um, scanner. So whether that be on like an iPad or a tablet, or like any other Android tablet um, or your, your phone, all of that um, works. So if you don't want to assign or if you don't want to physically hand out bibs at all um, and you're going to be using like non-tag timing or you're going to be using like links or something like that at the time, um, you can issue pre-race bibs via email. And those bibs are the digital bibs. Um, and so with that same, like we talked about the QR codes for lookup, and again, all of this automatically integrates with the rest of the race day suite. And we'll get to why that's so important with the, with the, uh, the hybrid timed events, because it, there's not many full, um, full service options to, or, or full service solutions to this problem. So something that you guys may or may not have played with yet is the uh, the pre-race virtual bibs. Um, I always call them uh, digital bibs, but um, the the pre-race virtual bibs you can either use one of our templates. So if you went in and just hit that create bib green button, there's I think I don't know eight maybe ten 
different templates that you can use. Um, and then there's all these variable fields that you can add in there. You can put the race name on there. You can put the participant's name on there. You can obviously drop the bib number on there. You can resize. If you double click on any of like this, it'll give you the layout. You can drop your logo onto it. If you, if you set it to use your own design, you can set this background to whatever you want and then drop this variable text in. Um, so you can really make it look good. Um, and both of these are basically the exact same thing. The only difference is the create bib uses our backgrounds that we just have as stock. Choose your own image. You would you would want to make sure you're you're setting up a 775 pixel by 600 pixel uh, image. And you know if people don't care, if your events don't care, set up. It takes you know not that much time to set up a stock your timing company bib. And it's a great way to market to people. It's the same thing that you're probably doing on your stock bibs if people don't want to pay for custom bibs. So again, it's just getting creative and making sure you're staying relevant and keeping your name out there. So again, I would strongly advise you to ask, hey, do you know, do you want your own design on your bib or you know, do you want to use our stock design? Um, and I'd be willing to bet a lot of the smaller events that you're working with are like, your stock design is fine. And so now you have your um, your logo on however you want, or you could put your logo on the bottom um, and their logo on the top and they'd probably feel really special. So again, it's just a matter of getting this in there. And then all of these other items are uh, variable text. And if you double click on them, you can change the color, you can change the font, things like that. Um, and again, this is a less expensive option. Um, they're not having to pay for the printing, which I realize is not that much of a cost. But again, the shipping of physical bibs that are pre-assigned is more challenging than you think if you've not done it before. Um, it just puts another layer of things that you have to pay attention to. So, race day check-in. Um, race day check-in, there's several different ways these are all different um different real races that that have been used for uh like in-person hybrid races um these two i think were the same race this was pre-event and again they have a plexiglass shield they're using the, they're actually using web check-in on a kiosk and um the people are being handed their bib in this scenario People are picking up their own bib. They're actually scanning the bib themselves on the tablet, and then they were instructed to use um, hand sanitizer. So again, this is creating like a no touch or a limited touch experience, and it's a creative, um, uh, should be in-person, not on-person check-in to keep people safe. So keeping people safe with the race day experience, we want to deliver tangible, real race elements, um, engaging with the athletes. And for some of these, especially with race joy, um, you really can embrace remote spectators. Um, for those of you that haven't tried, um, a lot of your venues are not going to allow, or they're going to set a number of, whether it be people or vehicles or what have you, um, that can come into the, the certain area at any given time. So, the idea for you is you want people to race. So spectators coming actually decreases the number of people that you can have on site. Um, I think uh, one of our, our salespeople, Jordan, uh, mentioned that Michigan has lifted their total numbers, and I hope I'm not misspeaking because I'm just passing along information, but I believe he said that that number was raised to 100 person gatherings as of yesterday or today. Um, so again, if if 70 people come and they bring 30, you know, loved ones or what have you, you know, you're decreasing the number of uh, participants that can physically be out there or in the, the general area without breaking rules. So embracing that remote spectator bit is actually more important than, you know, face value. Um, and obviously you want to offer a high value um, for your events. And you're going to be you're going to be competing with other virtual events and other events that are coming out, um, especially in the fall as these lift and a lot of uh, rescheduled events and, and normal fall events pop up. I mean, it, you're going to have a lot. There's going to be a lot of late season competition as restrictions are lifted. 
So the race day virtual results, these are user submitted finisher stats um, and they're real time scored results. There is this option to review prior, prior to publishing. Um, so one thing that you can consider doing is chatting with your events and pitching to them saying, hey, I will, I will help you with data management. And again, this is a way to generate revenue. Granted, you're not going to be able to charge whatever you normally do for timing, but you also don't have the overhead of um, tags or bibs or, you know, a hotel room or travel. So I, I'm not saying it's perfect, but at the same time, it does provide a revenue stream. So um, just keep that in mind as you're chatting with your events. Um, with the user submitted results, they're able to submit uh, their results in three different ways. Um, one is through RaceJoy. Um, they, they do have to run with their device um, and we'll get to that towards the end of this. Um, the other, another is uh, through SMS text. Um, I sometimes feel like this is the hardest one for people because so many folks don't follow directions when they're told they need to, um, they have to reply, yes, I wanna receive texts. So, um, or they've decided previously that they wanna like block text. So um, the, the web link is one of the best ways to get results posted, especially right now if you're doing challenges. Um, and again, these are for user submitted results, not for the hybrid results. So with this course setup, again, like in any of these virtual races, You've got to make sure, and for some of you, you, you're you just supporting these races, but this is something to look for. If they call you and say, hey, I'm not able to, I don't, I don't have um, enhanced virtual results. I don't know how to set this up. So the biggest thing here is making sure on step one of the race wizard, that beside their event type is listed virtual race. It's a drop down. They have to have virtual race. This is what, um, enables all those other features. Um, so they have to ensure registration is open and for RaceJoy, they need to set the, uh, they have to set the end date time. It's not optional. Um, and then they can add the distance for the event. And again, like we talked about setting up bib numbers for those, um, for those results. So for hybrid events um, or at, we're calling it hybrid at this point. So for hybrid events, you're more than likely going to have uh, flexible start results. And so for some of you that have been timing triathlons and maybe uh, time trial starts, things like that for years, um, wave starts and time trial starts are not that uncommon. Um, if you mainly time middle-sized running events, um, you know, waves and time trial, you know, chip scoring um, versus gun might be might be a little bit different. Um, the bigger thing to remember, and we're going to get into some of the race day scoring uh, reminders here in a bit, and that is, um, sorry, and race director, um, is that if your if your start time is longer than if you still have people starting when you have people finishing. Um, you're going to end up needing, you can't put a cutoff anymore if you've always been saying, well, at, you know, my race starts at nine, my first finisher will be at 920. Um, so every read before 919 is considered a start and every read after that is considered a finish. That process no longer works um, because you're more than likely going to be limited on the number of people that can start at any given time. And so you're going to need to start looking at timing and scoring with, uh, with gap factors. Um, so this is available for both um, race day scoring and race director. Um, I will say uh, I love the race director, but race day scoring knocks this out of the park. Um, it will make your life so much easier. Um, so in both of these obviously distribute race day um, results. So timing with gap factors. Obviously, you can offer staggered uh, official starts. Um, 
and all of these are just repeats. So I'll just jump straight into um, to some images. And if you're not already race day certified, um, that we are, and I, I've got the dates towards the end, we are providing additional uh, race day scoring certification and race joy certification. So if you've never seen screens like these, don't fret, um, we can train you, um, not a big deal. So for those of you that have, you know that you kind of make your way down this left-hand side um, as you're setting things up, um, and so our home, our sink, our participants, our streams, and now we're on our timing locations. So this specific event had only one set of mats out. And the reason why I bring that up is because we actually set up four different timing locations. So we have a start and finish for the one mile because there were four different events. Start and finish for the one mile, the 5K, the five mile, and the 10K. Um, the reason why I bring that up is because we're gonna go into the settings and underneath this location, I've kind of dug down into, I clicked on, and I think I can go back, yep. So I clicked on the settings right here for the start finish 5K. So here we are, start finish 5K. And we're gonna say that this is start and finish times. And again, we only have one decoder. This is a super simple just test setup that we did, but our decoder, our stream was set up underneath our streams and we assigned it to, we actually assigned this one decoder to every single location. Um, and so the big thing here is not so much this up here, but this section down underneath. And that is start read settings. When do I wanna stop collecting start times? Well, this race started, at 7 a.m. on May 2nd, and it ended at noon on May 3rd. So the big thing that I wanted to do is I needed to collect start times until the very, very end. So start times were collected until May 3rd at noon. And I needed to collect finish times the entire time as well. So I needed to begin collecting finish times on May 2nd at 7 a.m. And so every single person is going to hit this start finish line location twice. So the number of occurrences there is two. And the gap factor in between those two occurrences is set at 14 minutes. And we'll get to that in a second, but basically what that means is, I'll show you an example in a second. Um, what that means is that it will not consider a start or finish until there's two reads with a minimum gap in between of 14 minutes. If you have one read at 7 a.m. and one read at 7, 10 a.m., that 7 a.m. read is completely discarded. And now the 14 minute starts again at 7, 10. If they read again at 7, 20, then that 7, 10 is again tossed out. And now we're at 7, 20. If they read again at eight o'clock, now there's been a greater than 14 minute gap. And so the 7.20 and the eight o'clock two times are gonna be used as your start and your finish. Hey Chris, before you move on, yep. Um, yep. we had a question from someone asking if it's a requirement in race day scoring to have a common start finish, or are you able to set up if you're using actually different locations for your start and finish, you have separate decoders or readers for them? That's a great question. I actually did some training with uh, with race day events. Uh, I think it was a week or two ago on this same thing, and um, and they made my brain spin in circles until I finally got there. Um, and that is, you can have separate start finish in terms of streams. So your streams would be set up. You would have your your decoders. Let's call it decoder start. Your decoder finish. Um, however you would still name the location as a common start finish, and you would drop both your, your decoder start and your decoder finish into this location. And so it's going to be treated at, in terms of your, your setup, it's going to be treated similarly. But obviously physically, they're separate. 
And that allows you to maintain that same gap factor, what, whatever you want that gap factor to be. For this specific event, I had a 5K, a, a one mile, a 5K, a five mile, and 10K. And so I had four different gap factors. I think like four minutes, 14 minutes, 20 minutes, and 30 minutes or something like that. Any other questions? Yeah, it's a good question just came in. Um, what happens if someone finishes their race, then comes back and runs with a friend? Is that another set of reads? So it is not another set of reads. So um, it will, it is another set of reads. Your, your data will come in under the raw reads. And um, however, the first gap that they meet is going to be the gap that is used. Um, so the bigger problem that you'll run into presently is you need to be careful about handing out the bibs too early. So I think about this a similar way of uh, like mud runs. If you've ever timed a large mud run, um, mud runs will have start and finishes, separate start finish, and they will start teams from 7 a.m. until 4 p.m. And so you got people walking around that whole time with their bib on. So what a lot of mud runs have decided to do is actually put the bib assignment within the starting shoot. And so that alleviates the, the because if someone comes in and you've got to start and to finish and they put their bib on and they walk over to the finish and then 45 minutes later they walk over to the start, you can run into issues. So by you want to make sure because it's still treating those as a shared start finish. Um, so right now, uh, the way things are set up, you would want to make sure that once you hand them their bib, they're going and running um, for this hybrid scenario. So um, I do know that we do have some additional features coming out um, that will make things even easier and more streamlined. But just this setting right here, um, you can literally time people in your sleep. Um, I accidentally did one time because during this event, someone came while I was still asleep. They came at like 6 a.m. on a Sunday morning and they ran, finished, and um, it was literally getting timed in their sleep. So the way this works under the scored events is they select, you would just make sure you select your 5K scored event and your 5K start and finish. And so the five mile you see underneath has five mile selected and five mile start and five mile finish. And so I wanted to bring this up because this, it's not a perfect example because it doesn't have a bunch of extra gaps um, before and after, but this is someone who ran in that 5K and total, we had five different raw reads for this person. And so obviously they got close to the to the start finish and they read it 918.34. So then they obviously walked up closer and they decided to to run and they read again four seconds later. But it did not select this one because four seconds is obviously much less than 14 minutes. Then obviously they came through again around what 30 minutes later and from there they continued to hang out at the start finish for almost closing in on a minute but these weren't considered finish times this is the these only two reads right here are the ones that qualified for that gap and so within the system you can if you need to, you can delete out reads as needed. Um, you can filter by chip or by bib. You can filter by location. You can filter by ignored reason. Um, and again, this event only had one stream set up, but you could filter by the decoders that you had out there as well. And you can select multiple decoders if you wanted to. Um, and if you click that use button, it's just, it would filter out everything except for these two uh, yeses for this specific person. Any other questions about that before we move on? And we'll end up doing some additional training on timing with gap factors. 
um, since it is such a hot topic. And so the reason why all of this is amazing is because someone can register. They can be assigned a bib, whether it be hand, you know, handed out physically or they, they scan their own bib at a self-service station. All of this syncs dynamically with race day scoring. And now they run and whenever they read that first gap is going to qualify them. You don't have to pull their data down. You don't have to assign a bib number within race day scoring. All of it syncs and it syncs in your reads come in and you get a result, even if you're not standing there watching it. I know a number of people are, um, are timing races over the next week um, for global running day, global running week. And, um, and this is, this is basically the exact scenario that they're using because they're, they're running, um, people are starting and finishing at running stores. And the whole point of this is that they, you know, they don't have to be on site monitoring this at all times. Their decoders there, the, the people at the running store are passing them a bib out and the person walks out the door goes for their run and they come back and that's their gap factor and it's scored and they can monitor this remotely from their house obviously you would need you know sim cards in your decoders um you know but other than that it it works very very well so also you can do this very similar thing with race director. Um, and I put a, a link here. I just put some of the screenshots from the how-to, um, but this is actually how-to for, um, for the one mile of the same event. And so you just set each chip start time as a persistent wave with a common start finish. You set your timing locations and under your start finish, you go into properties, set your gap factors here, and there can be an allowed mix. And then what it'll do is it breaks down what meets the gap factors. And I, I believe it auto selects the first one and then, but you can go in and choose which set of gap factors you'd rather use. But this link um, will take you to the how to, or you can go, uh, you can search if you're not already familiar with it, with the, uh, the race director blog. Um, or sorry, the race director uh, Google, Google group, and I think the uh, the name of the um, post is COVID nineteen. So participant tracking. Um, so with participant tracking, you have text, email alerts with run signups, virtual results, um, or with traditional time results. This is unlimited. Uh, use with the race day licensing fee. Um, you also have race joys, GPS phone tracking and progress alerts, and there's no time equipment needed. The reason why we bring this up is because as a certified timer, you have the ability to sell race joy to, um, to races. And that's at whatever price point you want to set. Um, and however much work you're going to put into it. So um, on the run signup side, obviously they have a mobile racing experience. One thing to consider, especially for this longer, these longer events, these hybrid events that have a longer start finish, you might not have volunteers out on course, um, or your event might not have volunteers out on course, but their course is open at all times to go run. Well, by you know upselling race joy to them again, whether or not you charge them whatever you want to charge, that's up to you. But um, you can set up turn by turn directions, and this allows you to you know pro provide a a safer um, race experience for the athlete with less likelihood that they're going to get lost. And if you haven't played with it, race joy anywhere is now available which is a super cool feature that the person can go run and once they let's say it's a 5k run they leave their house they hit start on race joy when they hit 5k 
it will allow them to submit their time from running. Obviously, you could still have people to like get in a car and go for a ride around the block a few times. But I mean, in terms of validation, it's pretty close to being able to validate. So the key, uh, key features here are obviously your phone tracking. You can send cheers at, at different milestones along the course. You can have progress alerts as well. Um, scored results can be pushed out of RaceJoy to run sign up. So it makes them feel like they're having a bit more of an official race experience. And so if you have a set course or you can have set courses, you can actually monitor athletes as they're running along the route. Um, and so the beauty of this is, and we actually did like a test run of broadcasting this course to the web um, and then announcing finishers as they came up. And obviously there is somewhat of a lag. So just keep that in mind. But for people who can't be physically there, it's a really cool experience to be able to see their friend, you know, run around and do the course. Um, and again, you can set up the off course alerts um, for defined routes, which goes back into that, that safety function. So with the virtual results, you can have you can set it so they auto submit their GPS result through RaceJoy, and this is what it was, what it will look like right here. Um, and so it integrates with RaceJoy for real time mobile scored results. Um, they do have to have results enabled and set up uh, for in app results to function. And again, coming back to this, so please understand. The user must register for an event and have an assigned bib number. They can't just go in and start using RaceJoy without having registered. So some of your, your um, features as an organizer, um, whether it be a timer or a race director, you have custom content, you can put sponsor placement or sponsor information in there. I've had a number of conversations conversations with events who, you know, their concern is, okay, if we go virtual, um, how do we still connect with our sponsors? Because we can't put their banner at the finish line. Well, now you can put their, ban their banner across RaceJoy, or you can say, um, when each person hits mile one, there's gonna be a custom message that says, you know, like, hey, thanks for, uh, thanks for running the whatever shoe brand 5K with us, you're at one mile. Um, and so putting that custom course audio in there is, is awesome. There is obviously the communication system in there and you can monitor athletes within the race day, um, with, within the, uh, race day tools. So with the audio experience, um, they, you do need to record those messages well in advance. So don't wait to the last second. Um, I will say that you don't want to put a million of these in there. Um, people will complain if you if you're doing a 5K and you put 10 in there, you you will likely get complaints. So um, try to use them sparingly, um, maybe two or three. Um, I, I just wouldn't put a million unless you just want there to be talking nonstop while people are running. So with the race day monitoring, um, again, this is on the course. So you get a global view and access to the number of participants who have crossed milestones. Um, so it is super helpful to be able to track participants um, on a web console. Um, if Again, this is more helpful on the um, assigned courses and uh, hybrid events that you would be working with. But it, it would help you be able to give data to uh, municipalities or if you have like a limited number of officers or what have you, you could um, you could give that information. Um, I know previously it was super helpful to be able to show like the sag wagon where they needed to be and if they could tear things down, stuff like that. Um, so with the race communications, um, you can set news alerts, you can pre-schedule it, do it on the fly. Um, a lot of times these are used um, for 
uh, the on-the-fly ones are used for uh, weather alerts or notices, um, and you can put in content links and graphic. Um, so, uh, yeah, you can set up all of these. I would suggest spending some time doing it in advance, so you have, you know, plenty of time and don't feel rushed. And if you have any questions, you can reach out to us. So obviously, like we talked about, RaceJoy is only available through certified timers. So um, a lot of your races might not know about it. And it is a super, super cool feature um, that can make their hybrid or, or virtual event feel more real and put some normalcy back in it. Um, obviously, with the suite licenses, um, you get it's an annual license and you get uh, race day scoring and race director updates, your unlimited race day results and text alerts. Um, you get unlimited race day photos, um, special race joy pricing, uh, obviously your use for check-in bid management, race day registration, and um, and support through all of that. So um, if you get all set up and you have questions, you reach out to either me or Matt or the, the race joy team. I mean, it's uh, we're here to support you. So like we talked about, there, there is some upcoming training. Um, the race day scoring certification, uh, this is a basic certification, and that's gonna be Monday, June 22nd at 1 p.m. You do need to register for the training. Um, advanced training is actually being done one-on-one, -on -one, and you can email me, um, or and I'll, I'll respond with my calendar link, and then you can sign up for it. Mainly the advanced training is uh, 90 minute uh, segments. And if for some reason I'm not available, um, Matt Avery does quite a few, uh, Roger does uh, a number. So um, there's, there's plenty of folks that can help out with the advanced training. We do suggest if you're looking for advanced training um, to ideally have some topics that you do wanna focus on. So, um, so that we're not just kind of grabbing at straws. Um, if you are looking for like a, a refresher, um, I would strongly advise sitting in on parts of the uh, the race day scoring certification, um, or just let us know that you just need a, a freshen up on that um, on that basic training. Um, and then in terms of race joy certification, uh, the next day from uh, the race day scoring is Tuesday, the 23rd from one until five. It, there's going to be a, a basic and virtual um, training for race trip. So you will need to register for that training um, and those links will be going out shortly. So if you're not currently certified in either race joy or race day scoring, um, then you can um, sign up for those trainings and which are People keep asking. They're always asking the day after we do them. So you have a solid uh, almost three weeks to prepare yourselves for some awesome training. And then, uh, yeah, that kind of wraps everything up. I, sorry, I took so much time. Normally, I'll leave a little bit more for questions. So, Matt, are there any questions out there? Um, looks like I answered most of them. Uh, I have a question on the race joy of requiring a two week lead time. And I believe that's still accurate, but I wasn't positive. So do you know that or not? Um, I do not, but um I think Kath, be... best person to chat with would be um the race joy team on that one. I think that's still the case, but I would just double check with them. I don't want to say anything without knowing for sure. So if you just email um uh, is it info at racejoy.net? That'd be yep. the best. Looks like most of the other stuff was answered though. So if you do all have any other questions, feel free to shoot them in the uh, questions box now. Oh, so Derek's asking about a race day scoring uh, update issue. Um, there was one hiccup. It was several versions ago. Matt, was it dot one four? I think it was one four to one five. 
Yeah. Or no, one three to one four, and it's fixed in one five. So if you were on one three and are trying to update to one five, there would be an issue, or I think, or maybe it was one five one six. I can't quite remember. But it's all fixed if you just download it directly from the timer dashboard and install it on the top. So yeah, Derek, if you're on one seven, then I would, uh, or you're just on seven, um, I would just suggest um, downloading it from the timer dashboard. And after that, you shouldn't experience any issues. And then let's see. The presentation will be posted on our um, on our webinar page. Um, I don't know how long it takes to get those up. Um, it's usually fairly soon after. It might be um, might be tomorrow. Yeah, I'll, it'll be posted by tomorrow. Um, but everybody on the call will get a recording by tomorrow as well. Perfect. Is there a specific slide of examples of packet pickup, social distance that can be shared quickly? Um, let me see. It seems like I did a timer tip Tuesday on this, I think. I, I apologize. I've done so many webinars <laughs> recently that I get. Um, if you want to hop on our... Um, we have a YouTube channel that we posted a lot of our um, our content that we were generating. Um, I'm fairly certain. I just I can't. There's, Matt, there's you also know? a game. If you look at our blog page, there's um, community examples and uh, race examples, and there's all these photos, and there you can see a real quick way of um, how others are doing it. If that's helpful. Let's see if I can force this. There you go. And so there was one recently. Who was it? It was about. Well, there's a search function right here. Um, and so you can you can search them out. I can't remember whose. Whose event it was. Um, but it was very recently that we had a real event that someone showed I just don't yeah offhand I don't remember the um like something good to search on um to find actually of course as soon as I pull it off um here's one real examples of social distancing and it actually breaks down this is Todd Hinderlong um and he actually did a lot uh, one I think it was this past weekend and he's got pictures in there. Um, we did a, um, you know, he did all these barricades, how he went about getting permits, courses, corrals, check-in. So all of this, all of this is in there. So um, yeah, if you want to type in real race or something like that into the blog, it's just run sign up dot blog. Um, or honestly, you can scroll down. It's still on the front page of this. So just search the blog right here. Cool. Any other questions? Oh, hold on. Race joy menu. Andrew, I'm, I think I didn't see the first part of your question. He's asking, uh, do all race directors see the race joy link in the left sidebar and run sign up, or do they only see it if they have a selected a certified timer? So it's it's dependent on if you are a race director, yes, you see it. Um, if they click on race joy and go to set it up, it will prompt them to pay um, a large sum of money. Um, and usually that um, triggers an, an email 
to run sign up and that's when we you know explain to them using a certified timer and point them towards the the search functions um for timers on run sign up so a lot of times they'll they'll go in and search for certified timers um if you are listed as the timer um you still should see it actually um so but if you're given limited access not timer level access then um then you wouldn't see it. Like if you're only getting financial access, you would not see uh, that race joy link on the left side. So anybody that's listed as a race director um, sees all those options. Timer, you have limited options, so you don't see financials and things like that. And then you can divvy out um, access as needed from there. So it's under race and secured access and info sharing. Um, you can limit people's access to everything. Cool. All right. Well, um, it's been a pleasure. If you have any additional questions, feel free to reach out and uh, we will help you out. And um, hope you guys have a great rest of your Tuesday and week. Take care.